Welcome everyone to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross coming to you from the comfort and the vibrant colors of a hotel room and excited to bring you a very important episode this week. U.S. Open Power Rankings and analysis on the absolute tear that Alexander Zverev is currently on. Now, usually on Monday Match Analysis, you know how it goes. The final is on is on Sunday. Ideally, I uh, quickly have analysis there afterwards, and then I go to the preview of the next week, second. But I, I think I have a pulse on what the people want. I'm going to lead uh, first rule of journalism, you lead with the most important thing, and uh, I am going to lead with the U.S. Open Power Rankings because I think it is what the people want. That is my sense. Very excited for uh, for next week, the fourth major of the year, and um, the Power Rankings, which uh, it's not like clay court season where I've had, where you've gotten to see it week after week after week. This is the first and the only installment of of the U.S. Open Power Rankings. But before I get into it, just a reminder that this video is brought to you by Rally Tennis. Rally Tennis is a new mobile app that makes it easy to play tennis in your area, whether you want to compete or just train. Creating an account is free. Just head over to rallytennis.com or search for Rally Tennis in the App Store. And if you sign up and use me, Gil Gross, as the referrer, you'll also get $10 towards your account. So um, again, Quickly, the rules about the U.S. Open Power Rankings, and uh, then I want to kind of compare my feelings on this field compared to the Wimbledon field, and then I'll get into Zverev and, and why he's playing so well and and talking about his situation going into the Open. Lots to discuss with him. Um, the Power Rankings, I try to be a little bit more objective with them. Obviously, my opinion comes into play, obviously, but... Um, when I'm making predictions, sometimes part of my prediction is gut. But when it comes to the power rankings, I try to remove my gut feelings and I genuinely try to uh, just stick to to what I objectively think the the list should be when it comes to current form and previous success and results and trajectory. So those three things are the factors, okay? It is obviously a top 10, but... Four players just missed the cut. And I will reveal those four players now. Kane Ishikori, Yannick Sinner, Riley Opelka, and John Isner are the next four out. I still want to cover them. I still think that they are players to consider and to think about heading into the U.S. Open and they just missed the cut. So let's start with Kane Ishikori. Always extremely dangerous at the Open because of how well he handles the heat and the humidity. Better than almost anyone out there. And his overall fitness is often a difference. You can see that reflected in his incredible record in deciding sets. And Nishikori is back to pretty much beating everyone he's supposed to beat. If you look at his recent results, especially in the last couple months of, uh, of 2021. His recent defeats, they've come to players like Zverev, that happened twice, Djokovic, Nadal, etc. Withdrew from his match uh, against Hubert Hurkacz in Toronto, and he said that his shoulder was sore. Obviously, that's not a good sign, but he didn't say it was injured, he said it was sore. I think that's encouraging. He hasn't played since, but I think this is simply a matter of of basically muscle fatigue and muscle soreness and needs to preserve that shoulder. So I'm assuming he goes into the U.S. Open 100%, maybe dock a smidge uh, of, of points for the injury concerns. But ultimately, he is he is on this list because he has been beating kind of players that he should beat so consistently. But unthreatening against the elite lately, the win over Andre Rublev in Tokyo was particularly encouraging, but it is hard to see Kane Ishikori going past the quarters. Next up is Yannick Sinner. If you watch the Monday match analysis after Washington, D.C., you know I'm extremely encouraged by Yannick Sinner's progress, but that doesn't mean I think he's a great candidate for a super deep run in New York. The man is still not quite ready, and I think he needs 
Maybe it'll be next year, but probably the year after that until he's actually contending for these titles. I don't think his fitness is quite ready for physical best of fives yet. He has become more and more explosive and he moves better now, but I just don't think he has the muscular endurance that it really takes for uh, to go deep in a slam and to keep up that physical intensity. Um it's also important that we acknowledge the shortcomings of his recent results. If you take away that run in Washington, D.C., he has only one victory since Roland Garros. I mean, it has been a plethora of first-round defeats as he's really tried to grapple with many parts of his games. With that being said, Sinner can obviously hit anyone off the court on a good day, so he makes my list, and I don't think anyone wants to play him at the same time, an early exit, that wouldn't really shock me either. Moving on to Riley Opelka, a very interesting case. Opelka was nothing short of miraculous in Canada, beating Tsitsipas, RBA, Dimitrov, Kyrgios, and, and two others, I believe. Uh, the backhand, truly murderous. Murderous all week. Uh, a massive weapon. And overall, the movement and the consistency that he showed from the baseline was as good as I've ever seen from him. You combine that with his serve. It's a very, very intriguing package. Then he lost first round to Casper Ruud in Cincinnati, but I don't really take away any points for that. He clearly just needed rest and he gassed out. If Opelka is at his best, it might take an elite returner to beat him. And that would put him inside my top 10. As you can see, he's not inside my top 10, and, and here's why. I'm not convinced yet about his mental game. Yes, he competed well in Canada, but of course he did. His level was incredible. It was, it was playing out of this world, so of course his mental game is going to look good. It's when things aren't going as well uh, that I become concerned about Riley Opelka. And the pressure of being the top American male in New York, likely facing more adversity, that'll be a much better test of where he's at mentally. He needs to be resilient. He needs to try to keep his confidence up and avoid the negativity. Let's see how he handles this. But the reason he's not in my top 10 is because I don't know how he'll handle this. I'm not quite sure. John Isner, of course, the older version of Riley Opelka in a lot of senses. Uh, he's been a tough out all season long, far better than his 2020 form and much more re reminiscent of his 2019 form. Like Opelka, he impressed in Canada only to gas out in Cincinnati. Isner honestly lacks quality wins against players not named Andre Rublev recently, but his consistency is still something to notice, and of course he shrinks the margins against everyone he plays. He um, is usually extremely consistent at the U.S. Open as well. He has a 68% win percentage in New York. That is by far the best out of any of the other slams. He has two quarterfinals as well. And last year's round one exit is a major outlier. He hadn't been defeated in round one since 2008. I do think his gas tank limits what he can do these days. And he can't be in my top 10 because he just doesn't match up well with the best in the world, especially towards the end of the tournament. Now we get into the top 10, the players who have made the cut of the U.S. Open Power Rankings to the fullest extent, and at number 10 comes the Canadian, Denis Shapovalov. I picked Shapo to make the Wimbledon semifinals, and he rewarded me with probably my best prediction of the year. But since then, he's worked towards making my preseason analysis on him correct. Because before the season started, I said he'd have some big runs, but he'd struggle with consistency. And that's exactly what's happened as Chapeau is 0-3 since Wimbledon. His form aside, he's extremely dangerous, and it might just take a couple of wins for Shapovalov to start feeling good about himself again. He's at home on the North American hard courts, which showed in his impressive run to the quarterfinal last season, where I thought that was a major turning point for him, and he was playing the best tennis of his life, obviously one-upped by what he did at Wimbledon just a month ago. So I put Shapo in my top 10 despite the poor form, and I do so confidently without hes hesitation. I would say, if anything, I considered putting Shapo higher on this list, but ended up settling at number 10. At number 9, 
comes Matteo Berrettini. Now, this is a big step down from him. Of course, uh, if you remember my Wimbledon power rankings, Matteo Berrettini was, I think, number four, if not number five, but I want to say he was number four. Um, look, Berrettini obviously made the Wimbledon final, but I'll tell you what, in hindsight, it seems like he was really running on adrenaline because I would not have predicted that the thigh injury that he was dealing with at Wimbledon would have put him out so long as he tried to rest and recover from that. He really hasn't played much tennis. He missed the Olympics. Uh, he came back for Cincinnati. And I got to say, his return was a little bit concerning for me. Uh, mainly, not because the, the ground game didn't look great or that there was rush showing in other areas, but I was concerned because his serve didn't look 100%. And let's face it, he needs that shot to be there. And I just have doubts that the serve, which was so hot and firing on all cylinders all throughout the grass court season, I have doubts that it's going to just get back to that level with inadequate with an inadequate amount of of match play. Here's the pol positive for Berrettini. He's always looked good in New York, including a semifinal run in 2019. I still think he runs into currently unsolvable problems against the best returners. Uh, and if he's highly aggressive, not if he's highly aggressive, his highly aggressive game, uh, if that gets loose due to rust, he could go out early. The reason he lands at number nine has nothing to do with the fact that I'm feeling better about him than normal. No, I'm not. It's just based on what he can do in general and based on how comfortable he's looked at the U.S. Open in the past. I think anything lower would be disrespectful for Matteo Berrettini. But I'm, I'm expecting a possible early exit for, for Berrettini. Or if he does go deep, obviously I wouldn't put that past him. I don't think this is the tournament where he's going to have the fitness and the rhythm and the confidence to uh, to pull off an upset late in the tournament. Coming in at number eight is Hubert Hurkacz. Hurkacz has been really difficult to figure out all all season. It, it's been a weird year for him because it, it feels like to me he's either losing in the first couple rounds or making these titanic runs. He owns wins over Medvedev, Tsitsipas, Rublev, Shapovalov. That's an awesome list of wins for just a single calendar year. But then you turn around, you look at a bunch of early exits. Most recently, lost to Liam Brody at the Tokyo Olympics. Not a player he should be losing for. His last two losses have been highly respectable, however. Against Medvedev in Canada and PCB in Cincinnati, in my opinion, two of the hottest players in the world. I do prefer Hurkacz on fast surfaces, where his serve is most effective, and so are his net approaches, but I can't argue with the result he had on one of the slowest North American hardcourts in the world, Miami, and an event that really does play pretty close to the U.S. Open. Uh, I do like to take into account Indian Wells in Miami when I'm thinking about the U.S. Open and what could happen. Obviously, we didn't have Indian Wells. We won't until October. But in Miami, Hercotch's run was unbelievably impressive. And his other title also comes on the North American hard courts at, in Delray Beach, where he didn't face much competition. But nonetheless, he went all the way. Hercotch is sort of an enigma to me. I got to be honest. His results merit a spot on this list, and they merit a, a somewhat high spot on this list, but I have trouble figuring out just how dangerous he is, and again, you know, sometimes I have certain doubts about just the meat and potatoes of his game, the ability for him to hang in baseline rallies with the very, very best uh, from the back of the court, and... I also think that his return could use some improvement, something that I've just began to notice. It's taken me a little while to kind of get on that. But man, Hercotch is weird to play against, funky. Uh, I don't think it's a comfortable situation for, for anyone to play against him with his flat strokes, the way he keeps it low, how he serves big, how he moves pretty well. He generally keeps the ball on the court pretty well, and he comes forward. He comes at you. It's an interesting combination. Hercotch, very tough to figure out for me, but he comes in at number eight. At number seven is Karen Hatchinov. I don't recall putting Hatchinov in a power ranking leading up to a slam in a very, very long time. I think I've done it. 
I don't think it's the first time in the history of the show, but I feel like it's been a while. It's good to see Karen Hatchinoff back in good form. He's improved in the two areas where he's really needed to, first serve pace and forehand consistency. The slower, higher bouncing courts at the U.S. Open should suit his extreme forehand grip and mark him down as someone who can handle the intense physicality of the U.S. Open, the unforgiving hard courts, the intense temperatures, the slower conditions leading to the longer rallies. To be completely honest, I'm not sure why the U.S. Open has been his worst major by far when it comes to results, but I'm going to ignore that and say that won't last as his career goes on. Hatchinoff should draw confidence from his performances at Wimbledon and Tokyo, both excellent, and I'm not concerned about his results coming back from Tokyo and North America. A lot of players really struggled in Cincinnati coming from Tokyo, and, or excuse me, in Canada coming back from Tokyo, and Cincinnati is a way faster court compared to the U.S. Open, and I think of all the, of many of the hard court tournaments, it's not the tournament I hold, I put the most weight into when projecting U.S. Open results. Hatchinov's consistency in best of five has been very impressive as well. Not often has he been upset early uh, at Grand Slams. When it has happened, it's happened at the Open, but it's been pretty rare. While he doesn't have the variety or the well-roundedness to beat the very best, he's likely to stick around for a while in this tournament, and I feel comfortable putting him at number seven. At number six, Pablo Carreño Busta, another guy who I think has probably not been this high on any power ranking going into any slam, but the last time he appeared in a U.S. Open power ranking was likely last year's U.S. Open because PCB loves the Open two times. He's a semi-finalist at the Open, and right now, I think he's playing the best tennis of his life. So going into his favorite tournament in the best form I've ever seen him, of course I'm ready to put him high in the power ranking. What he's done with his schedule is rather interesting and worth noting. He chose to rest until Cincinnati, but still get two weeks of tennis in by entering Winston-Salem, where he took a last-minute wild card. So most players who skip Cincinnati at his level uh, just played one week, just played Cincinnati. I keep getting it confused. I mean Canada. Most players who skip Canada to play Cincinnati will go straight to the U.S. Open, but PCB wants his two weeks of tennis, and he's playing Winston-Salem. Given his durability, I don't mind the move. He's got very, very, very good fitness, generally holds up very well, although he did get injured earlier this year in Australia. His serve is very average for someone this high on a power ranking for a slam, but his baseline game has just simply looked dynam dynamite. The consistency, the depth, the evenness off both wings, his ability to attack the short ball right now, all very, very good. Because he got injured in Australia, we didn't really get to see him on a hard court really until Tokyo, and there he beat Medvedev and Djokovic and won bronze. But my confidence in PCB actually comes a lot from the clay court season. It is not his best surface. It has never been. But he's clearly he was clearly better there than he has been ever before. And it took Tsitsipas to take him out of Roland Garros. It was not good to see God Mode Medvedev absolutely wipe the floor wipe the floor with him in Cincinnati. But I think Pablo understands he ran into a buzzsaw there. And look, Medvedev is above PCB in this power ranking. I'm not going to adjust my thinking that much just because Medvedev beat him badly. I'm confident in PCB against really anyone outside the top couple tiers, and that is why he lands at number six in this power ranking. He's going to be a tough out. At number five is Andre Rublev. Let's see how he follows up beating Medvedev. It could be a huge mental unlock for him or not. But what he said, he said it was like passing university. It was like graduating from university, Medvedev University. Check it off the list. That could do wonders for Medvedev. It, it, it could make him believe. Now, yes, he got destroyed by Zverev, which is another very tough matchup, but maybe still beating Medvedev will give him a little bit of confidence. I can't say his game was great uh, until that. And I'm still, I still don't think that's going to be a good matchup for him in his career against Medvedev. I just think, you know, he managed to beat him. And that's a good thing for Andre, no matter how you spin it. On hard courts, his consistent aggression off the ground is too much to handle for most players. And the U.S. Open has been a really good place for him. It's where he broke through back in 2017. And his win over Matteo Berrettini in last year's round of 16 
was one of the best wins of his career, probably the best at a major, considering most of the big matches he's played at slams have ultimately been disappointments for Andre Rublev. I don't think that's a coincidence because ultimately, I think physically, he's not ready to win a slam. He plays a very high energy style, and I just don't think he can maintain that in best of five without breaking down. He still needs to work on his legs, work on his movement. He's stronger in the upper body now, and it's improved his serve, but... Honestly, I just don't think he's there yet physically, and he needs to keep going. The second serve has been a massive problem as well. If he plays the right style of opponent who knows how to attack that second serve, it could be trouble. I would make him a sizable underdog against all the players above him on this list, but the reason he's number five is because I couldn't confidently really make him an underdog against anyone under him in this list. However, I do think that there is a drop-off at number five. And I think all of the players above Andre Rublev, as I just alluded to, are kind of in the next tier up. So with that being said, let's move on to number four. Number four is Stefanos Tsitsipas. Tsitsipas was up at number two for the Roland Garros power rankings and then was way down there at number seven for Wimbledon. He's in the middle for the U.S. Open. He's going to be at number four. Tsitsipas' physical and athletic dominance will serve him well on the slow hard courts of the U.S. Open. He's been serving extremely well, I've noticed recently. The forehand is dominant, as always, and the backhand has been impressively solid for the most part. I think he's played a lot of really, really good tennis in the lead-up to this U.S. Open. I find it extremely odd that he's struggled so much in Queens. Obviously, the Chorich match last year was an absolute disaster, but I really don't think his struggles will continue for much longer. And the U.S. Open could be his second best slam after Roland Garros. Maybe Australia, but I'm just saying, I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't say it's out of the question that the U.S. Open can't be his second best slam. The return of serve, unfortunately, remains an issue. That has been very, very clear even after the Roland Garros final with Djokovic. The Opelka match in Toronto was particularly concerning because it really felt like Stefanos was rather hopeless against Opelka's game plan to serve in volley to Tsitsipas' backhand. And for this reason, I think Tsitsipas' draw is very important. He wants to avoid big servers. And the, the only player in the world who stands a chance against him who doesn't serve huge is Djokovic. So that's the positive. I think a lot of players who serve big can give Tsitsipas a lot of trouble. But when it comes to players who don't serve big, good luck beating Tsitsipas right now from the baseline. He's too physical. He's too solid. The forehand is too good. And it's going to be an absolute nightmare. Lastly, I just want to say Tsitsipas still has maturing to do emotionally. I think that's been clear recently as well. He still doesn't seem completely calm on the court. He is relying on his father a lot, uh, whether... You know, however you want to interpret that is kind of up to you, but I still don't really love that. Obviously, it's not within the rules to, to fully do so, uh, but, you know, it just seems like he's still kind of that young player who continuously looks to the box, is emotionally volatile, and I just don't think he has fully matured on the court yet. I could probably get past all that. I could ignore it, the fact that he looks to his box a lot. If he wasn't blowing so many leads, it's becoming a huge problem and a huge pattern. Most of the matches he loses, he's ahead of them uh, before he, he loses. So um, some concerning patterns there. But if you look at the level he's at, it's still extraordinarily high. And I have no hesitation putting him above everyone below him in this power ranking. Absolutely none. Um, it is clear cut to me that he, uh, that he is number four. At number three, and we could get some debate here, at number three is Alexander Zverev. Zverev is red hot, and I'm going to get in a lot of depth after I'm done with this power ranking in Zverev. The question for the North American hardcourt season was, will the Olympics give Zverev enough confidence to stop waffling in and out of his best form? Because that has been the story with him writ large, is not that Zverev isn't great at his best, but that his best doesn't last long enough and that he doesn't bring his best on a consistent enough basis. But Madrid was dominant. Tokyo was dominant. And now Cincinnati. 
a really stellar performance from Zverev. It's just in between those things, you have low points. You have, you know, some fragility like he showed um, in the last two majors that he's played. In a lot of ways, it seems like the answer has been yes, though, to the Olympics question. He wisely skipped Toronto, and then he came out swinging in Cincy. He used his power more, particularly on his forehand down the line. Uh, more on that later. But overall, he's just going after his ground strokes more, which makes all the difference for him. The problem is I've seen these things to some extent in the past, and the question with him is about maintaining his level. Frankly, frankly, I still have my doubts about that. His confidence tends to be fragile which means it escapes him periodically and often at bad times. So the questions are, how will he respond to serving some double faults? Will he still play boldly if he's in the lead against his rivals at the end of the tournament? He hasn't been able to do that so far. And it just seems as the pressure builds, as the pressure mounts, his confidence becomes more fragile. That is a concerning tendency. He hasn't been under pressure in these other tournaments that I just mentioned against Djokovic, an underdog, right? Um, and a lot of his worst habits have still come out in snippets. And again, I want to save some of the analysis for, for later. Um, but Zverev comes in at number three because I want to avoid recency bias. I want to avoid recency bias. He has looked absolutely sp- unbelievable and unplayable in the last two tournaments he's played. But think about the tournament right before then. Wimbledon, that was unacceptable for him to lose that match against Felix. So I still have questions about his mental. I'm not sold. And that is why he's still at number three to me. I still have questions about him upstairs. Let's go to number two. Daniil Medvedev. The last thing I'll say on Zverev real quick is that's what makes him so hard to predict is because it's difficult to discern the mental stuff and there's such a wide range. Medvedev comes in at number two. Look, this is very simple with Daniil. Made the final in 2019, was stopped by Dominic Team. Well, guess what? This year, Team is not in the draw. Oh, excuse me. Was stopped by Dominic Team in 2020. Um... Team not in the draw was stopped by Nadal in 2019. Nadal not in the draw. Um, won Toronto, looked to be in charge against Rublev until a freak accident with the camera and physical exhaustion towards the end there from the pack schedule, which I believe ultimately brought him down. To me, he's looked to be in his absolute best form recently, playing with his highest level of patience and consistency. It's reminded me a lot of 2019, and his success has been well-documented at all of these tournaments. If you look at the U.S. Open, it's pretty much the only hard-court tournament post-Wimbledon that he has not won. It's been impressive dominance, elite serving, elite returning, elite court coverage. All of these things are givens for Medvedev. Now, his matchups against Tsitsipas and Zverev seem to be favorable ones as well. And to me, that seals the deal. It makes him an easy choice for number two. If there are drawbacks for Medvedev, it's that he's easily rattled. And we saw that with the camera incident. And again, some things can happen that really throw him off. But as, you know, when he is focused and when he is calm when he is in his best form, which he has been for the most part. To me, Medvedev is a clear-cut number two, and I would need to see Zverev in a big match against a rival like Medvedev play his best from start to finish until I believe that that can be done by Alexander Zverev. So right now, Medvedev, my number two, over Alexander Zverev. The number one will come to... Come as no surprise to anyone. It is Novak Djokovic who heads into New York with the Grand Slam on the line. U.S. Open success for Djokovic in his career probably underrated considering he's made seven finals. Considering the last two times he's lost, he actually hasn't lost a match point. You have to go back 
to uh, 2016 since he's actually lost a match point at the U.S. Open when he did so against Stan Wawrinka. Hasn't had great luck in the finals. He's only won twice in the seven finals he's been in. Not like Australia where he's converted on Sunday every single time. Um, but you got to look at what he's done this year. Australian Open and Roland Garros runs to the title. Absolute masterclass showcases of his technical ability. While Wimbledon really exemplified his unmatched ability to win without his best. He burned out in Tokyo, both mentally and physically, and as a result, he had to take an extended break and comes into the U.S. Open without any recent match play. This is not ideal for anyone, including Novak, but I don't think it's a huge deal, as I've explained in a previous video. At his best, he matches up well with all of his rivals. And keep in mind, if Dominic Team were 100%, that statement wouldn't hold, but Dominic Team is not 100%. So Novak matches up well with every single one of his rivals. The only concern for him is the pressure. I can't remember there being more pressure on a player since Serena Williams going for the Grand Slam at the U.S. Open, and she lost to Roberta Vinci in that semifinal. On the men's side, maybe not since Roger Federer at the 9 French after Nadal lost. The pressure on Djokovic right now is enormous. And that has to be taken into account as a negative, something that could go against Novak. With all being said, his recent track record at the Slams, there is no room for anyone else at number one in these power rankings. And there you have it. Your 2021 U.S. Open power rankings. Just to quickly repeat, next out, Kane Shikori, Yannick Sinner, Riley Opelka, and John Isner. At number 10, Denis Shapovalov. At number 9, Matteo Berrettini. At 8, Hubert Hurkacz. At 7, Karen Hachinov. At 6, Pablo Carino Busta. At 5, Andrei Rublev. At 4, Stefano Tsitsipas. At 3, Alexander Zverev. At 2, Daniil Medvedev. And at 1, Novak Djokovic. Let us move on now to Alexander Zverev after I take a sip of water. So Zverev's playing great. He's on an 11-match win streak, and I want to start by talking about something technical that he's doing really well right now, um, and then I want to talk about the mental in a little bit more depth than I did so in the power ranking, okay? So first of all, um, I think the, the big thing that has jumped out to me about Zverev is mainly his use of the forehand down the line, and there are bigger picture things that the forehand down the line and his usage of that shot signifies but I can tell you right now, if there's one thing that indicates that Zverev is going to be a really difficult out, it's when he's using that shot to, to effect, to great effect. Um, and in the past, it has been an underutilized shot for Alexander Zverev. He's had a tendency to go cross-court repeatedly, to be predictable in his tendencies to hook that forehand cross-court over and over again. And predictability is not a good thing. It's bad, but it's even worse when that predictability goes into the righty forehand. Most players on tour, that's their strength. That's their power shot. And as a result, the players who are really comfortable generating offense from that spot and that wing, which are so many players, some of them with the, with the really high level of firepower, they have really hurt Alexander Zverev by... Hitting, pulling him out wide to the forehand, and then anticipating the cross court. It's been a really good formula against Zverev. It's also the more passive directional. And even when Zverev has tried to be aggressive going cross court, it's been a little bit harder for him to finish points with that forehand. And we've certainly seen that. And let me just explain why real quick. When you go down the line, well, first of all, a winner, a drive winner, is obviously when you get the ball to pass a certain plane. It passes the plane of the opponent. Just like at the net, we call it a passing shot. From the baseline, we could call it that too. We don't. But again, it obviously passes the plane of the opponent. So you can imagine a straight line. Imagine a straight line across the court. That is the opponent's plane. Well, if Zverev or if a player hits the ball cross court, it takes longer, the ball travels further in order to cross that plane. Again, it's a parallel to the baseline. Imagine the plane, it is, it is parallel to the net and parallel to the baseline. If you hit it cross court, the ball takes longer to cross that plane. 
if you hit it down the line, it's a shorter distance for the ball to cross that plane. Higher part of the net, um, not as much space until the baseline. That is why the down the line shot is the riskier shot that is harder to put in the court, but it is also the more rewarding shot offensively. So it's the more passive directional, it's predictable. There have been a lot of issues. And I think the reason why Zverev has had hesitancy going down the line is because he's had trouble flattening the forehand out. I think it comes down to the spin. His down-the-line attempts can be hit with too much topspin, and that results in a couple things. First of all, his opponent having more time, but also the ball having a bit of almost side spin and tailing towards the opponent, towards the middle of the court, making it easier to defend. But more importantly, I think that's secondary. More importantly, if you hit a down-the-line shot that does not break your opponent's contact point, that does not put your opponent in a difficult position, you are going to open yourself up to the cross-court pattern. It goes back to time. The ball hits that plane faster, but if it hits that plane faster and it's not damaging, well, you've had less time to recover to the middle of the court. So if you go down the line and it doesn't work, it's bad, which means if Zverev is not comfortable and confident going after his forehand, of course he's going to go cross-court more often than he goes down the line. If you're unwilling to flatten your forehand out, naturally you're going to go cross-court more. And I think what has happened is Zverev has, first of all, just beefed up his forehand. Did it slightly in 2020, but then it went away again. And now it seems to be back, and he's flattening it out. He's hitting it down the line. He's hitting it flat down the line. And when he does, his power really comes out. So he's doing much better damage with his forehands from behind the baseline on the deuce side. And think about a tennis match. Just think about that for a second. How often is a player in that position in the modern game? A forehand from the deuce side behind the baseline. I mean, that is a common position. And Zverev, in the past, that has not been where his offense has come from. It's come from, a lot of the times, the backhand wing. But if it's going to be the forehand, it normally comes from inside the baseline where he can go anywhere or it comes from his best forehand, his inside-in forehand. But by adding the forehand down the line when, when he's on the deuce side, is added a completely new dimension to his game. That is my technical nugget on why Zverev has been so difficult to beat. Over the course of 11 matches throughout the Olympics, winning gold in Tokyo, and last week, winning in Cincinnati. Now, um... The question for New York, as I said in the power rankings, is, is his wave of confidence, is it temporary? Is his belief robust or is it fragile? Is it going to go away or is it here to stay? Now, he has a gold medal and playing for country is often a catalyst for confidence. I think about the big three and... Federer early on playing uh, Team USA and leading Switzerland to a victory. One of his earliest kind of arrivals on tour, a young Roger Federer. Nadal had the same thing against Team USA again, against Roddick. Djokovic ultimately winning Davis Cup in 2010. Oftentimes playing for, for country and having great results there. It can be a catalyst. And maybe there are reasons to believe that winning the Olympics is going to be some career-altering moment for Alexander Zverev. Maybe you believe that. I'm not fully convinced. Now, I'm going to throw a couple of reasons for doubt at you. Some of them, I think, are more valid than others. First, I want to kind of dig into Cincinnati a little bit more. Against Tsitsipas, he got ahead, and then he really wobbled once he got ahead. He was up a set and a break, and then he, he changed. And we've seen that so many times. We've seen him build a lead and not play as well with the lead. Playing generally much better from behind. Now, he, he did play well with the lead against Djokovic, but it happened so fast. It was like a it's like a blitz. There wasn't even much time to think about it. Uh, but against Tsitsipas, got ahead, then wobbled. Then there was another turn because he started feeling very ill, very sick, and he didn't want to move anymore. And when he didn't want to move anymore, he started hitting out on his shots super, super aggressive. 
and doing some of the things I just talked about, flattening the ball out. Well, that helped him. It helped, I believe. It was no surprise to me. Let me put it this way. It was no surprise to me that Zverev not wanting to move as much and credit to his toughness and his grit. He really did show a lot of toughness in that match. It was no surprise to me, though, that Zverev, when he didn't feel like running, actually played really well. So what would have happened if he didn't have that kind of weird circumstance? Plus, Tsitsipas was a little bit choky himself in that match. What would have happened there? Um, I don't know. But then against Andre Rublev, dominant. I mean, he he has Andre Rublev solved, just like Daniil Medvedev has usually had Andre Rublev solved. And then he serves for the match and everything's going really smoothly and he double faults twice and gets broken and just plays a horrific game. What is that? Where is that coming from, right? Now, I don't think that's good evidence. I, I truly and honestly don't believe that is good evidence to say that Zverev mentally is unchanged and to doubt him going into the U.S. Open. I really don't. Now, I present you that evidence because I want to give you all the arguments and I want to let you guys decide. The listener, the viewer, I, I want you guys to decide. I present you that. I don't think that is the best evidence. Here's a much better argument. The double faults and the forehand wavering, that has been going on for about three years now. And it's hard to find an explanation for that stuff going away, unless you think the Olympics is going to be some magical turning point. So right now, what do we have? Right now, we have a little bit of recency bias. I like to zoom out. I like to look at the big picture. That has remained a problem. And at Wimbledon, the last major, that was a problem as his serve went completely off against Felix Oje Aliassim and he lost a match that he should never lose the way FAA was playing. Full respect to FAA, but he didn't play that great a match and Zverev was just awful. That wasn't that long ago. So if you zoom out just a little bit, it doesn't paint this overly positive picture for Zverev. I think at some point, Alexander is going to break through and kind of get out of this. But it might take baby steps. There might need to be an inner intermediate period because so far, he has not come up big at these majors against the best opponents, especially towards the end of the tournaments. Um, and I'm just not convinced that that is suddenly going to change or that is suddenly ready to change right now. I am not convinced. Um, I would not be stunned if it did, but that that's very different from being um, convinced. Now, I think the analysis that Zverev is kind of a lock to be a changed man right now, I just, again, I don't see any evidence for that considering we've seen dominance from Zverev and we've seen that just go away. It's not that the confidence is never there. It's that the confidence goes away. That is the problem. When is the confidence here to stay? That will remain the question for Alexander Zverev. Make sure you're following me on Twitter at Gil underscore Gross. I'll have a U.S. Open preview out. Uh, recording Saturday night. The draw is out on Friday. I will talk to you then. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.